Hello and welcome to this companion class to Entering Hecate's Garden, the magic, medicine, and mystery of plant spirit witchcraft. I am so pleased to share this book with you. It means so much to me. I was always the odd child who spent her time escaping from a family and a world that didn't understand me into the green world. The woods were my best friend. They were my companion. And it was in the woods where I connected with the spirits of the green world. And I believe I walked on knowingly at the time with Hecate, Cerce, and Medea. They were guiding me deeper into my connection with trees and plants, flowers, animals, and stones. All of the green world, the wild world, was so, so very dear to me. Um, and it's part of my earliest memories. I love the green world. And the green world is Hecate's garden. You know, in this day and age, we uh, we can be conditioned to think that Garden refers to a plot of cultivated land. But in the mythic sense, Hecate's garden is the entire world that is natural and free and wild, that functions according to its own laws and is truly a different nation than what we are as humans. Yet we are deeply connected to it. And if you identify as part of the archetype of the witch, however that may be for you, Hecate's garden is one of your spiritual homes. So welcome home to Hecate's garden. This book is fundamentally a journey of healing. It is about the integration of the shadow and soul into a beautiful, wholeness that we can experience as we dive into the magic, medicine, and mystery of Hecate's garden. And in the days in which we find ourselves living, there is so much going on in the world that we can be infected with. Fear, anger, consumerism, uh, envy posting on social media, and so on. There are so many traps that the collective shadow energy that is so dominant right now can, can snare us in. And just by purchasing this book, you've staged a quiet rebellion where you are claiming the key of the goddess's garden, which is about returning to the natural world. The power structure wants us to be denatured. They want us to be separate from the green world because we will always feel a lack. And as long as we feel a lack, they have us exactly where they want us. When we are feeling lacking, we purchase more. We get caught up in political things. We do all these things and we forget who we truly are as a witch as a daughter of Hecate, son of Hecate, child of Hecate, we lose all that. And this is not our fault because these things are very powerful. But by joining me here on this journey into Hecate's garden, you're saying, we're saying the jig is up. We know about your tricks uh, that are not fun tricks, that are tricks designed to make us feel less than and invalidate us, keep us trapped in fear and hostility and all these negative things. The jig is up. We've figured it out and you're not on our side. So buying this book, claiming the key that I offer through this book into this garden, opening the gates of pharmacaea is a rebellion. And I applaud you for purchasing the book. The book itself is a ritual. It is a spell. And in every page, I have woven in words and verses and my experiences as a way to share this magic medicine and mystery with you. 
So before I dive into talking more about the chapters of the book and a little bit more about how to use the book, let's begin, as we do in the Keeping Your Keys Coven of Hecate, with the Triformis Ceremony. So we begin the Triformis through lighting the sacred flame. I've already got, uh, this is the coven candle, and this is my Hecate candle. I've already got those going, but let's light a special candle um, for our time together, blessing your studies with the book. So now we have our three candles lit. Beautiful. All right. And now let's get into the ceremony. The first part of the ceremony is kernos, which is an ancient practice descended from Hecate's witches, where we unify uh, land, sea, and sky, earth, water, and air with ourselves, with the deeper world. And we do this using a sprig of a botanical. Uh, I typically use juniper that I wild harvest here. You could use rosemary or thyme, even lavender can work. Um, juniper is great because we can find it, it's growing, it's a landscaping plant. So it, it, you might, might be really nearby you and you can just snip off a little bit. So juniper, so beautiful, we light it. Procul o procul este profani sit mihi fas odita loki. And then we emerge it in the water. And I'll repeat it in English. I banish the profane from this place. I speak only the truth and I shall be heard. And I offer you as I bless myself with this protection of kernips, banishing all harm, I offer it to you. That is our first stage. And then we use a candle again to create sacred space unique to the circle. And this class we're having together here is truly a circle. So I'm going to cast this circle, protecting the time we have together through this sacred flame of the Eros Pier of Hecate. Protected from all distractions. And then we finally do the blessing through sacred smoke. You can use this, you could use an anointing oil, uh, a spray, like Circe's filter in the book, you could use lots of different things if making sacred smoke isn't available to you. So I think we have some yarrow and mugwort and lavender that I offer you today. This beautiful blessing of sacred smoke. Mugwort, of course, amplifies our witch powers, our psychic self, and it's really a great opener to the unconscious and the deeper world. Lavender, clarity, love, uh, some protection, and yarrow for healing, all healing. Beautiful. So that is the Triformis ceremony, which is Kernips, Yeros Pier, um, and the uh, sacred smoke. So now that we are in our beautiful space together, let's move into talking about this book. So the book is uh, arranged in 13 sections. So you'll see that straight away as you open the book, you'll see these 13 sections. And these 13 sections correspond to uh, the structure of any magical or spiritual uh, working. So the first section of the book, prologue, which is Medea's truth, refers to that kernel, that fire, you know, that glimmer of Hecate's torches within us that speaks to the truth of the matter. That's always what compels us to do a ritual or a meditation or a spell. It's all about the flame speaks to us and says, this shall be done. So that is the truth. 
we enter into anything we do as Nissa. I love the word Nissa. Nissa resonates so much with um, Hecate's aspect as the initiator. So Nissa is an ancient epithet of Hecate's dating back over 2000 years. And Nissa has a lot of um, different applications in uh, the ancient Mediterranean. It may, means beginning, uh, milepost, way marker. It was also used in the chariot races. So if you'll come with me, let's travel through the Kairos back to the chariot races for a little bit. Uh, the markers that the, the chariots would whip around in the Colosseum. So Nyssa is about the energy of initiating the turning point, the tipping point, you know, but it's that momentum that the space of leaving behind the past and entering into the new, entering into the garden carries with it. In the Keeping Her Keys Coven of Hecate, we have different levels uh, for our initiated members and what we call the first key, they are known as the Nisai. So they have that beautiful spirit of beginning, that momentum of the beginner's mind, which what we might call it in modern psychology today. Any working we have has a source, an origio. Origio is about the compulsion, the underlying drive that fuels the Nyssa, right? So if Nyssa, Nyssa is, so if uh, prologue, the prologue is the, the spark of the flame and the flame feeds the Nyssa, the call, and calling us into whatever we're doing. Origio is the root, which we might say in Taro, you know? So Nyssa might be the surface, but Origio is the root underneath the surface. And then preparatio is the foundation. You know, there is a root that is very deep. And then upon that root, we can build a solid foundation. So we have very powerful healing rituals, meditations, and so on. And then ratio is the system. So in the Keeping Her Keys book, I talk about the principles. I talk about uh, three principles that I identified in that book. Of course, there's many others, but I talk about kindness, passion, and integrity. So uh, passion is associated with the lower self. And, um, and in ratio, you can learn more about the three cells and the three worlds and so on. But I wanna talk a little bit about these three principles from the Keeping Your Keys book and how they do provide a system. So the lower self, the seat of intuition, magic, emotions, the root, this is the root. And any work, so this gets us back, we're building upon that root, right? This is what we're doing here. And that is represented in the body by the area lower than the belly button, the sitting on top of your sitting bones. So when you're sitting in a chair, you can kind of get still and feel that there is a hum in that. So that's our root. Um, and so we, exp we approach any working, let's, what's the root of the working? What's the intuition? What's the emotion? And so on in, in associate with the lower self. Uh, and then we have the middle self, which is about the interaction between self and other. So, you know, other can be other people. It can be the green world. It can be even Hecate herself, but that's what our heart center is about, right? It's about that interaction. So when you're doing a working, what is it about the interaction between yourself and other that uh, you're being called to, to do, to, called to heal in whatever it is you're doing? And then we move up to the higher self, those beautiful branches that connect us to Hecate's temple, the starry road, and all that is up above, the intellect, the mind, the gifts of the the civil in terms of uh, her intelligence uh, and so on. So the civil, of course, functions within us at all times. It is the ancient seer, that archetype. And she often has this emotionality connected to the lower self and the middle self and the upper self as well. So the civils often start from Hecate's cave, the lower self, 
uh, and then work within Hecate's garden, the middle self, and ascend in their prophecies up into the higher self. So the Sybil, um, who is a very, very powerful uh, part of Hecate's companions, she may come forward to you as you get deeper into these lessons, just as Hecate herself and Circe and Medea may come forward. So enter into this awareness of the green world that becomes a, a sort of oneness. And as you get unified within the lower, middle, and higher self, not only will pharmakeia, um, maleficarum, witchcraft, peonios, healing, become more activated, but Sibilica, the higher self, the intuitive self, will all become more activated as well. So that's why it's important to have a good foundation and do preparatio um, and to explore within any working, what is the foundation? And then to use the three cells and other systems such as the planets and the elements um, to develop a system for any working. And I, I use this model in my teaching and I'm going to tell you as someone who's been teaching for years, meditation, ritual, and so on, uh, not just courses, that having a system is fundamentally the most important part when you are going into any sort of ritual with intention. Of course, we have our spontaneous experiences, and I talk about those in the book, such as encountering the wild pharmacoi, that totally are seemingly at the surface level, opposite to you know, this kind of structured approach, but yet when you sit with the experience after and you go into the medicine of the experience, you can use the 13 sections of the book um, to help you process the medicine. So either the, the process happens either uh, for, you know, before a priori or it happens after post hoc, but it's going to happen. And the structure of these 13 different stages um, I offer you so you can use it either when you're getting ready or after you have a spontaneous experience of the medicine of Hecate um, to work through it so you can maximize uh, the dosage, if you will. Practica is the process, how you're going about these things. So let's look in the practica section for a moment here. So there's something I wanted to, to reference this directly. I have start this with through my mistress's powers and my will, do I claim you spirit for which is work? I borrow your essence boundless and intact, keeping only what I need and sending extra back. And I wanted to just draw that out, expand that little poem a bit. If you are completely new to the practice of pharmakeia, plant spirit witchcraft, there can be a lot of hesitation about using plants and a concern that you might somehow be harming a plant. You know that if you take a little snippet of it, that you're taking something from the plant and therefore damaging the plant. And I want to applaud you for having this concern that shows that you are intuitively uh, you know, a, a practitioner of pharmacaea, because you're already understanding that plants are conscious and they speak to us. I also want to caution against thinking that the removal of a little sprig of juniper from a plant is in any way akin to, you know, like clear cutting a rainforest. It is entirely different. Clear cutting rainforests are only done for profit and gain, for not, they are not of service to the soul, they are not medicine. When you remove with respect uh, and gratitude a piece of botanical matter, or if you have purchased something, margarine, thyme, whatever you've purchased, 
that if you are entering into that with reverence and respect and the attitude that you'll only take what you need and not waste anything, that you are serving the green world well. Because although the green world is truly a different nation with different goals and objectives and dreams of its own, uh, we are entwined with it. You know, it is like the lover's cart in Taro. We're both different, yet we're so entwined. And as you go deeper into that connection, that attachment with the green world, you'll discover that there are this, the plant spirits often long for us to interact with them. They are like a lover that has been ignored too long or a lover that has been mistreated for so long, that they desire a lover, us, the pharmakeia, the witch, to interact with them with respect and an affection and a sharing of our medicine, and not in the clear cutting or the, you know, the, the horrible things that are done to the green world in the name of profit and greed. It is really about this beautiful relationship that is reciprocal and mutually healing. So that's why I wanted to include that little poem from my own notes. Practica, really, yeah, there's a list of the different things you might want to stock up on. And again, always, my practice is always, we use the minimum possible. We don't hoard tentacles. We have a, you know, we have a complete and useful apothecary, not one that it is for show or, you know, vainglorious means, but one that is something that we use. So if you are completely new to this, I highly recommend using your intuition, collecting, connecting to that lower self to get into this space of where you should be. Now, of course, in our day and age, uh, white ceremonial sage has become very popular. I, if you look behind me, um, I just heart, I grow quite a bit. So I have bundles and bundles of it in the shed and hanging all through the house. Um, you may not be able to grow your own sage. I will say that it is a good place to begin. Again, let's look, think back to our poem, which is our creed, only take what you need. So if you are starting with sage, that's great. Be mindful and respectful of where you purchase it from and only get what you need. You need a very, very little to get started. And if you do buy one of those bundles, take your scissors, snip it open, um, break it apart, and then you'll have lots and lots. You could, that'll last you a year of purification and protection and so on that's associated with sage. Sage can help open, open the, the self to the, uh, the soul and so on too. So, you know, be responsible um, when you're purchasing. So Sage, I recommend you can start with that. Mugwort is a bit amplified, definitely really powerful. Again, you know, buy what you need. Bay leaves, very powerful. So many great uses that I talk about in the book. So if you were to start with those three um, and bay leaves in particular, you know, are very easy to work with, very amenable to almost everything. So those, and I talk about those three a lot in the Keeping Her Keys book as well, if you wanna get a, a slightly different uh, slant on those three pharmacoi, Kyria, master teachers. Um, I do caution in, in this chapter on the process about plant spirit possession. So I've already mentioned how we, as pharmakeia, as witches, we have a natural connection to the green world and we can see them as consciousness. And sometimes we start to forget that they are other than us and that they have their own will and their own goals, their own bent towards life, their own desires. And we can go in too deep, too fast, not have our own, uh, Temenos, our own boundaries in place that are protecting that temenos within us, our sacred space. And if we go in too quick, too hard, um, some plants, particularly some of the more aggressive poisons, aconite, foxglove are two examples, would uh, potentially possess us, which is to say we would start to take on the consciousness of the plant spirit. 
Aconite is very aggressive, very deadly, also has healings. It's very, very about bringing death. So if you are getting possessed by aconite, for example, you might get very sharp in your tone. You might lose your compassion for others and so on. So when you are starting to work with these plants, studying the monographs and then looking at yourself in your journaling to see if you are starting to, to take on the qualities of the plants in a way that you don't have control of. Very important. That's why those monograph, the monograph details are so important. Uh, and then I talk about different infusions, sugar syrups, love sugar syrups, and so on. Finding your own moly or molly, which is a term for the witch's favored uh, pharmacoi, our most trusted plant companion. Uh, mugwort, for example, is my holy moly. Although Dittany occupies a very different but similar place with me. So all the different formulations. I love oxymouse, get some vinegar, get some honey and make some oxymouse, you'll love it. Uh, the next lesson is on fire, which is a great lesson to learn, ways to prepare your incense, all about smoke and ash and uh, making your own bundles, which are fabulous. I've made, when I did my sage harvest, I made a bunch of bundles that are drying out in the shed now. Ash is fantastic for making sigils. So, you know, when you're done with uh, burning your herbs, um, you know, let them burn down and get, get them to the place where you get a nice ash and you can use it for so many things. Anointing the body, it's really beautiful. And then the next, so we're up to lesson eight now, which is Gnosis, the knowledge. So this is the section with the 39 monographs. I have uh, correlated the monographs with different things. So let's just, I'm just turn to one here. Let's find one. Oh, basil's a lovely one. Basil, if you want a fourth plant to start with, I do recommend basil, lovely basil. So I include the Latin name and the Latin name is always good to have because if you have the Latin name, you can start to research the genus, which I also include the family and the Claude and so on. So you can see if the plant that you have is truly of the basil family. This is really important. And I'm going to give you a case study in this that uh, mandrake, mandragora, American mandrake, mayapple, many names, um, is typically sold um, as perhaps mandragora by some less scrupulous retailers, when in fact it is American mandrake or mayapple. Mandragora is a very specific European plant that is not widely available. So if you know the Latin name and you're purchasing something, uh, you can look at the label and if the, an herbalist doesn't have a label with a Latin name on it, you don't wanna buy it in the first place. You always want the Latin name. So then I classified herb, uh, basil of course is an herb, but you could see plant, resin and so on. To the spiritual properties, the physiological properties, and the magical properties. And this is very important because pharmacaea is the practice of holistic witchcraft. And that means that we always consider the three functions of any plant spirit medicine, spiritual, physiological, and magical, and how they will all interact with whatever we are doing. Then I talk about the parts used. Again, that's another way for you to identify with your, your, your growing and also your wild harvesting if you're using the right thing and to double check when you're purchasing something if you're getting the right stuff. Planetary correspondences. I typically uh, list one or two. We have Mars and Venus here. In my teachings, I primarily uh, focus on the original sacred seven, which is the sun, moon, Venus, Mars, Mercury, Saturn, and Jupiter. Uh, sometimes if a, the newer planets, so Uranus, uh, Neptune, and Pluto, which may or may not be a planet, but let's stick with that idea. These newer planets that have only been identified in astronomy and astrology for a few hundred years, 
Sometimes I will include them if it's very important. But with those three planets, uh, what's been done in uh, ast astrology is that characteristics of the original sacred seven, who are all encompassing, have been reassigned to these new heavenly bodies. So if I say it is a plant, for example, of Mars, and you've read somewhere that it's associated with Pluto, then you can say, okay, so it's about the Plutonian aspects, which are the depths, healing, um, emotions, and so on, that has been kind of sloughed off of modern Mars, for example. Um, elemental correspondences, very good to know what you're dealing with. So the elements, uh, you know, comprise all of the universe, and any plant, of course, has representations of all the elements, but they will have one that is dominant, just like they will have a dominant planet. Uh, the archetype uh, for Basil, uh, Basileia, which was easy, which means empress. So Basil means emperor or divine ruler. Um, and I've included the archetypes because I want to, to illustrate how the archetypes, which are the, the you know, the prima matter of all things, how the archetypes are symbolized and their medicine comes through plants. So in developing the archetypes, I've used ancient epithets of Hecate, Circe, and Medea. Um, and you can connect with that. You know, you can approach Basil as Basileia, the empress, and you can connect with Hecate as, and Circe and Medea as the empresses of witchcraft by speaking Basileia, uh, whether or not you have your sprig of basil on hand. The middle world, so basil is very much a plant of action and so on, interaction. Zodiac, Aries, Scorpio, you can see we've got fire there and we've got Scorpio representing those aspects of Mars on Scorpio sometimes today. Modern astrology, of course, is uh, corresponded with Pluto but it's about the deeper aspects of Mars. And I've added a color, a stone, in case you need to make a substitution, and also an animal. Again, so you can connect to the archetype. Basil is about being, you know, the uh, queen of the, the realm. Um, but also it has that fiery kind of energy. You know, the ram has horns. And then I go through indications if something is safe, how you, you know, like it. You shouldn't use it under certain conditions. Basil is very safe usually. Different formulations, you know, carry it, grow it, uh, pharmacaea, talk about ways to use basil for courage. And then I have one of my favorite all-time spells and one that my students love as well, the double B banisher, walking you through that spell. So that is an example of one of the monographs um, and just, and I, there's a huge section, 39. It was so hard to pick only 39, let me tell you. Um, but you will find so much in there for you to explore and to be inspired to experience the plants in your own way. And you'll find embedded within the monographs are all the different recipes for making a complete Hecate's feast for offering her on the dark moon. The next uh, chapter is Magicaea. So here, let's get into spells. And I start this section with uh, the, a little poem of saying, I am the spell. And, you know, although this book is very much about interacting with plant spirit medicine, we are the spell. And this also harkens back to my point about possession. You know, we want to maintain our sovereignty. The plant spirits are powerful and mighty. They can possess us. Hecate and Cersei and Medea are immense and beyond our comprehension in many ways. Yet we are, although other and different from them, part of them. And we are the most powerful part of any of our spells. I uh, actually work through a spell of mine. I'd call it the anatomy of the spell. One of my kind of classic spells that I do. So I hope you enjoy that witch bottle spell and that it inspires you to make your own witch bottle. I love my witch bottle spells so much.
And then we get into uh, poppets. I love poppets. So there's lots on poppets in there. Uh, and that if you're in the coven, we have a huge lesson, uh, workshops, video workshops and so on on poppets. So most of the things in Magikea in the book, if you're a member of the Keeping Your Keys Coven of Hecate, you will find a corresponding course so that you can go deeper. So we have a Nyssa course, we have a Magikea course. And the next section, section of the book, Sibilica, we have a Sibilica course that is all about divination and our prophetic gifts. So dive on into that. Uh, reading the leaves is so much fun. Uh, get yourself some bay leaves to start and uh, work with them and you'll really have a powerful experience. Then we're moving on again, you know, any working has at its heart some kind of prophecy, some kind of deeper medicine that comes from the unconscious, that comes from the essence of the garden, that comes from Hecate, Circe, Medea, perhaps the Sibyls themselves, and our other allies who abide in both the spirit world and the physical world like we do. All ritual spells have that aspect and a lot of times what can happen is that we get so busy in seeking the attention of Hecate and so on that we forget just to pay attention. Sibilica is fundamentally based on paying attention to our dreams. You know, we walk in the world of Sibyls every night when we sleep. We are connecting to the unconscious, which is like a funnel you know, that is just part of this huge world of spirit that we can connect to. So make sure you pay attention to your dreams whenever you're doing a working before or after. There will be great medicine in the dream time for you to pay attention to. All workings have an aspect of the sacred, whatever we are doing. And I'm just going to read a little passage from this section of the book. We restore our sacredness through the nourishment provided by our altars and rites, entering into the delights of Hecate's feast. The spiritual sustenance offered through the witch mother can be augmented by celebrating a feast that also feeds the body, our corpus sacris. Such feasts can also be offered to Hecate, Circe, and Medea. We share in the reciprocal bounty of the sacred feast that blesses soul, mind, and body. The triple goddesses are well pleased by our offerings made from their garden. What favors them most is when our offerings are sincere, whether an elaborate cheesecake, which I have the recipe for in the book, or a simple sharing of our favorite chocolate bar. We are their descendants. In a way, our lives reclaiming our sacred practice of plant spirit witchcraft, that is the offering. We are stepping into claiming the keys of our own sacredness, our own powers. And that is the best offering, not only to ourselves and to the green world, but also to Hecate and all of our ancestors and goddesses and so on. Leaving an offering at the crossroads on the dark moon is a profoundly transcendent experience. I recommend you to do that. And I discuss that in that chapter. I also go over the Triformis uh, ritual, the Triformis ceremony, which we began our sacred learning circle here together with and how to adapt that and so on. And then we come to the wisdom. All workings, all meditations, rituals, spells, our daily journaling. There is wisdom again to pay attention to that comes from the Sibilica, that comes from the Sophia. And that is the wisdom where we sit afterwards, perhaps make our drawings, go to a walk to contemplate and so on, that we receive the wisdom. The Unifying the Three Cells Meditation, uh, which you can find on the Keeping Your Keys SoundCloud, or uh, I think you can find it on uh, Keeping Your Keys podcast as well. I really recommend that. Uh, and after listening to this class, I recommend going to find that. Uh, and I'll put a link to it, make it available to you. 
And starting with that as your daily practice, it is transformative. Uh, and there's a description, I talk about it here in terms of connecting to yourself as, you know, root, stock and branches like a plant. Fire dancing, one of my favorite things to do, just step into Hecate's fire with the sacred smoke and burn. So lots to get into in that lesson. And then we finish with initio, the mystery, initiation. I claim my rightful place among my kindred in the garden of the goddess. I end all of my books with initiation because my books are structured to be a program of study for awakening the soul and connecting to the deeper world and truly experiencing the numinous. And it is only through experiencing Hecate, Circe, Medea, the numinous, the deeper world, the unseen, the spirits, that where we will ever find wholeness. And this is what is so sick in our society today is that there has been a denial of the need for the numinous. You know, if you go to a doctor, they don't ask uh, about your soul. Uh, church and religion has just become about dogma and fear and hatred. You see, we see this all around us. It is the opposite of the numinous. It is destructive in the sense that it is harmful, not destructive in terms of, you know, we need to release and bring death to what no longer serves. It's destructive and then it's designed to denature us, dewild us. This book is very much a rewilding book. Um, it is designed to not allow us initiation. And we experience initiations in so many ways. And it's very unique and powerful. Initiation occurs whenever we have that sense that we are deeply aware of something much greater than ourselves. And that this awareness transforms our conscious self it can change our behavior, the way we think, how we feel, how we interact with others. It literally is an awakening of all three selves, root, heart, and mind. Root, heart, and crown, right? A complete awakening of that soul serpent within and that experience of wholeness when we break through the illusion of separation and once we have an experience of the numinous, which you will have with plant spirits, whether it's through sacred smoke or anointing the body, even just buying a plant and really coming into that consciousness with the plant, getting back out into nature and so on, that you will start to experience the numinous. And that is the momentum towards wholeness. And that is initio. That is the mystery of it all. This is not the, the world of Hecate's garden, Hecate herself, Circe, Medea, the farmer Koi and so on. They are non-rational and non-linear. We have been so deeply programmed to think it has to be something we can put on the table, it has to be measured, has to have a cost associated with it. And you know, all these things that we've been programmed by the patriarchy to that they believe, of course you're here so you know these things are all false, right? But this undoing this programming, and I have a great lesson in the coven on undoing on, uh, on spiritual programming, that as we go through this book or whatever training we're doing, as we undo the spiritual programming, these are like chains that bind us. You know, Rick Sipile Hecate is the great chain breaker. So as the chains become unbroken and we move more into our own discipline, our own structure, our own passion, our own integrity, we will start to have more and more profound experiences of the mystery. And we will stop, you know, trying to equate the numinous with uh, consciousness because it's different. It is completely different. Dreams come to us in symbols. Plants speak to us in symbols and emotions. Even when they use words to convey what they have to say to us, it can be a very different language, very mythic poetic language. Hecate, Serse, Medea, and the others all speak to us in symbols and images and in a non-rational way that is deeply emotion. And when you are in the place where you are overcome and you all of a sudden burst into tears 
or you are surprised by joy, that is when we are truly getting into connection with the spirits of the garden and of Hecate and Circe and Medea themselves. And that is the mystery, right? That is when we override the thinking self, the monkey mind and get into that. And it's not meant to be fully explained. It's meant to be experienced. I have a ritual here uh, that's been done by many, many of my students that um, I've adopted for you to claim your place. Uh, as a mistress of Hecate's garden. It's a very beautiful, beautiful ritual where you go into the cave of initiation. And so that is an overview of the book. So I just want to close by talking a little bit about Hecate, Circe, and Medea, who I have such deep affection and affiliation with. When we are going into the garden, it is important to keep in mind that our experience of Hecate, Circe, and Medea will be unique. We will have messages from them. Again, they are often very mythic poetic and we may need to sit for days or weeks to interpret from them. We will have visions of them and they will come to us as we need to see them. They will be our medicine. They had such powerful, powerful medicine to share with all of us. Study them, walk with them, lean into them, trust them as you trust yourself and your world will be transformed. Thank you so much for spending this time in this circle together. I'm going to leave the candle lit and feel free to take some of this energy I freely offer with you as you embark on your journey of entering Hecate's garden. <laughs>